we talk about uh, evolution uh, in this upcoming episode, and we firmly believe here at Mind Pump that the evolution of fitness and exercise programming is MAPS. Oh, whoa. That's I was a bold one, statement. I was wondering how you were going to tie this in. That was, it, uh, it totally well, is. It well totally done. Well played, sir. Well played. Well, well clap. done. Golf when, clap. Golf clap, please. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Well done, sir. When you look at uh, how fitness programs, especially resistance training, originated, they were full body routines with not that much programming, but they identified how frequency really worked well for muscle adaptation. Fast forward. We learn about body part splits. What we take away from that is different angles, different techniques, but they missed, they lost a lot of that early uh, information um, from the early days. MAPS takes both of those and takes it to the next level. We understand the importance of full body routines. We also understand the difference, or excuse me, the importance of different phases in training your body for different types of adaptation. We understand long-term programming as well as short-term programming. You get that with the MAPS Super Bundle. You have long-term programming. You follow the programs included, which include MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Anywhere, and MAPS Prime. You follow all of those, and you have about a year's worth of exercise programming. But on the micro scale, you've got programming on a weekly basis, on a every three- or four-week basis broken up into phases, and then on a 12- or 14-week basis. Your routine never really looks the same. Your body continues to progress. It's the most comprehensive exercise programming you will find anywhere. It is the, the culmination. Perpetual progress. It's the, the culmination answer. of all the science and truth the answer. that we've encountered in fitness. You can find the MAPS Super Bundle it's the answer. at yeah. mindpumpmedia.com. It's the answer iTunes review winners, it is time to get your shirts. We have 17 reviews from this last week, and because I'm the only one in the studio, I'm going to give away six shirts. The winners are Jesse's Baby Daddy, Not Your Average American, Former Hard Gainer, T Crook 88, Miss Jammy, and Disc Guy My. All of you are winners. Please send your name, the one I just read, to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Press God damn it, Doug. Are we on? <laughs> hey. We are slacking. We on? We on? We on? We on? I can't wait yeah, to the I, day. I, I, I can't wait to the day. Doug beats up Adam. Yeah, <laughs> and he throws some shit at me after after I say that. He just he, he just, just like bites your face off. What if he starts fighting you? Jumps and, on my back and then and you chimp? defend yourself, and then you quickly realize that he's can like, actually. Kick oh my your god, ass. he's like a, like <laughs> a piranha. Like he wraps just, me up. I can't. Just, get yeah, and then me and Justin have to like prevent, like pull, like oh no no, don't <laughs> kill Adam. <laughs> don't he's actually. He's an important part of the show. Actually, rip him to shreds. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen, listen here, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I would say. Different guest right now. I mean, it, mo- okay. I think we have to warn. Mm, you do have to put a little precaution out there. We do. We have yeah. to warn our audience because you to to listen to an episode like this, you have to have an open mind. And right away, there's going to be people that are just like, ah, like, what is this? Oh, it was very interesting. Don't talk about evolution. Don't talk about religion. Don't talk yeah. about these. These are it's taboo like, like the big nose. No, yeah. it was a great conversation. It went in a lot of different areas. It got very deep. I had a lot of fun with it, and if yeah, it was cool. If you're a deep thinker, you'll probably have a lot of fun with it. You're going to hear us talking to Perry Marshall, uh, who's the I don't know why I said his last name like that. Really weird. Just <laughs> Marshall. Marshall. Oh, it's a Perry Marshall. <laughs> he. Uh, why is everybody <laughs> Luigi, dude? I don't know. <laughs> what? Because what? Yeah. he's the author of a. We book. all understand it. He's the know? author of a book called Evolution 2.0. Uh, the Miracle of Evolution and the Story Neither Side Wants You to Hear in Politics and Religion. Darwinists and design advocates alike have missed the most amazing story in the history of science. Very interesting uh, concepts in this book. You can get three free cha- chapters of this book at CosmicFingerprints.com. And you can also find them on social media at Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash 2.0 point evolution. So without any further ado... Here we are talking to Perry Marshall. Buckle up. I knew of you through some of the books you wrote on, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, advertising, 
all interesting stuff. But uh, when I go on YouTube and see some of the talks you've done, you're you're talking about some some subjects that are very different. You're diving into the meaning of life. Very very interesting yes. topics. Let's talk about evolution, Perry. What is the new information uh, that you're researching telling you? What are some of your ideas uh, when it comes to evolution, uh, DNA, uh, how our genes have changed throughout the you know throughout the the you know the eons? Uh, let's start with that. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, th- there is a massive change that is going on in medicine, in genetics, in evolutionary biology. Um, and technology and, um, people are getting little tiny bits and pieces of it, but I I don't think most people really grasp what's, what's going on and, uh, what the world is shifting to is from a reductionist view of the world where ultimately everything's just chemicals and everything's just made of its component parts to realizing that the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. And in order to really understand the world, you have to take an integrationist view. And a lot of this is being fueled by technology that's informing us about biology. So, for example, when the human genome got decoded in 2001 and we started to be able to affordably sequence all this DNA, there was all this excitement. It's like, man, this is a secret to everything. We're going to figure everything out. We're going to solve all these diseases, and we're, we're going to do all this stuff. And, of course, now there's things like 23andMe, and you can, you can find out your genes, and you can find out how many of your ancestors were Neanderthals and how many of them were from Denmark and, and whatever else. But that project really has not delivered more than about 25% of what it's promised. And that's because it doesn't actually start with the gene. The the gene is a trailing indicator. It's not a leading indicator. And what most people have been told about evolution is about half to two-thirds wrong. Uh, It's very misleading. And, um, and, 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 and technology is really revolutionizing this, uh, we, because we are able to learn so much, uh, you know, from sequencing DNA and from, uh, you know, all the microscopes and, and, and the health, uh, breakthroughs and, you know, synthesizing genomes artificially, which is now starting to happen. I mean, there's Craig Venter's lab in California is now, uh, selling partly artificial bacteria that produce proteins in higher quantities than it's actually a little scary. Yeah, explain, go um, in, go into that a little bit real quick. I don't, let me hear about that. I don't know. I don't. All right. So, so, so a few years ago, Craig, Craig Venter was uh, one of the guys that, that led the human genome project. Okay. And, uh, once he got that under his belt, they started synthesizing, um, uh, uh, new cells. Now, you, you really have to understand they're, they're using all borrowed parts to do this, <laughs> okay? They're, they're f- kind of Frankensteining existing stuff. It's not like they're making new cells <laughs> mm, from mm-hmm. scratch. But what they are doing is they're making new genomes from scratch. They're going, well, we're going to string these particular pieces of DNA together. We're going to replace this bacteria's DNA with a different DNA, and we're going to make it do different stuff. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and it's working. Um, I, I, I do, however, um, despite my, my inner geek, you know, thinks it's really cool and interesting, I think it's really frightening because – um, the whole entire profession approaches this topic, uh, making some very shaky assumptions of all, how it all got to be the way it is in, in the first place. And uh, I, I think we are a bunch of 12-year-olds with our dad's toolbox um, tinkering with a Ferrari engine. And, <laughs> you know, like if... Um, Even more than that, it's, it's, so much, it's, it's so much more complex than that. I think we're... We're not even scratching the surface. And right. when you look at, like, I was taught, I mean, when you learned just 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, when you look at DNA, the majority of it they called junk DNA because oh, that, 
because huge mistake. Oh, huge mistake. They saw all this all this DNA that that looked like it did nothing, and so it, they called it junk DNA. Well, we don't really need that. It's not it's not there for any particular reason. And now we're learning it's far more complex than that. There's actually a purpose for that. You, you know, you could probably hang this whole entire conversation on the junk DNA hypothesis because that would be exhibit A of, of what's wrong with the thinking in evolutionary biology. Um, like that, that's like, there it is. That's your beacon shining light of, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, like that, the whole junk DNA theory is the result of assumptions piled on assumptions, piled assumptions, mm-hmm. uh, most of which were wrong. Okay. Great, great job. And, Sal. And, and you have, to, you have to back, 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 back way up. And, um, really you have to go back to the 1920s to the 1940s to get back to where science went wrong on this. And yes, this has, this has implications, with the environment has implications uh, to this uh, experimentation that's going on. It has implications for fitness and medicine and nutrition and everything. And like, we need to, whoa, like have some much greater reverence for nature than we have. Well, I just, I just think, I think it's very interesting how we, how we view uh, the human body and view um, DNA in particular and how for forever now, since the discovery of it, we've been told this is your set program. This is mm. this is this is your blueprint, and this is how things run. We've even been told rather recently that up two thirds of all cancers, for example, are the result of genetics. And now we're learning through emerging science that you can actually change how your genes are expressed through everything from what your mother went through uh, before she even had you to the foods yes. that you eat to the thoughts that you have in your mind. Um, uh, I mean, talk about it being far more complex than we could have ever imagined and even more than we even imagine now. Yeah, so so two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, I was in Southern California and I had lunch with a gentleman named John Torday at UCLA and uh, he's uh, he's an expert on various aspects of evolution in his work, uh, for which he's funded by the NIH, is in the area of how smoking affects children's health. Hmm. And he's been studying this for decades. And he said to me, um, he said, so Perry, there are 300 different measurable effects of smoking on the health of children, he said, you'll never guess what the number one effect is. And I said, well, I'll never guess. Tell me what it is. And he said, it is epigenetic markers inherited by the child from their grandmother who smokes. What? Wow. Okay. Now let me, for People that don't know what epigenetics is, let me uh, unwrap this. So, so if you buy a piece of so- – let's say you download a free piece of software and um, some menus are grayed out because you haven't paid for it yet. Um, the, the idea of graying out certain menus but then switching them on, um, this is what epigenetics is. It's – it's a template that's overlaid on top of your genes, which can be changed without changing the genes themselves. Now, the epigenetic templates, so in your body has 200 different epigenetic templates, and when, uh, when a sperm and an egg grow into a fully formed uh, baby, the 200 different tissue types are built by taking the same genetic instructions and overlaying 200 different templates on top of them and going, so we're going to gray out these genes and we're going to build um, bones. And we're going to gray out these genes and we're going to build muscle. We're going to gray out these other genes we're going to build an eye, okay? Now, those templates are dynamic and they change. And from generation to generation, 
um, your your body changes its epigenetic templates in order. So like you get calluses, you start you start playing guitar and you get calluses. The calluses are from the epigenetic templates in your skin switching around and going, we're going to build up more dead skin in this area so he can play the guitar. So this is changing all the time. Hmm. And these are inheritable. Wow. And what he was telling me was when the grandmother starts smoking, her body does all of these epigenetic switchings in order to fight the poison from the cigarettes. And those epigenetic switches get passed to her daughter, to the next daughter, and the and the the grandchild actually gets more health problems from those epigenetic switches than than the daughter did. And wow. it's the genetic effects of smoking that are actually the single worst effect of smoking. Uh, it's even worse than what comes in the atmosphere. Wow, that's fascinating. Hmm. N- now. That that's like wow, that's like a giant epiphany all by itself. But I want to point out something that this tells you about evolution. Now, in 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 a, in about 1800, there was a guy named Lamarck. Lamarck invented the field of biology. Biology was not considered a separate field until he realized like you need a whole extra set of rules if you're going to uh, analyze living things and. Lamarck had a theory um, that uh, learned traits are inherited uh, to, and passed on to the children. And Charles Darwin embraced this idea. And, and Charles Darwin's original theory of evolution, for all of the controversy and everything, it was his 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 conception of it was really simple. It was very oversimplified, but it was it was roughly correct. It was about right. But it was missing a lot of details. And one of the things that Darwin embraced was Lamarck's idea that an organism can have experiences, uh, adjust to those experiences, and pass uh, those experiences to its offspring. And he had no idea how to do it. He made up this term called gemules that go through the bloodstream, and, 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 uh, and, and he believed this. Well, fast forward to the 1930s and 40s. Now they understood a lot more about genetics. They still didn't understand DNA, but they they thought they understood more than they did, and they threw Lamarck out. They threw um, inherited traits out, and they said, no, there is no learned traits that actually get past the offspring. It's all random accident. It's all just, you know, copying errors of the DNA and so forth, and natural selection weeds it all out, and we combine that with the other rules of genetics and that's evolution. And here we are. And that was called the modern synthesis or the neo-Darwinian synthesis. And, and it's this pretty much the same as what Richard Dawkins wrote about in the selfish gene when that book came out, or if anybody's ever heard of the blind watchmaker, this is the standard Darwinian theory that you hear now that people don't really know is quite different than what Darwin originally came up with. And it's wrong. It is profoundly wrong. The selfish gene theory is as wrong as thinking that the sun revolves around the earth. It is literally that wrong. So, okay? so, it's, so when, you, when you, you talked about 200 different templates that we've identified, and we've got, you know, how many genes uh, present in humans? 20,000 or so. That's 20,000 or so. Um, and we've got, you know, uh, incredible, I mean, millions and millions of miles of just DNA. It's the combination and the, the different, uh, ways you can combine these templates with your genes. Oh, it's astronomical. It, it seems like, uh, the, the, there's just a, an incredible amount of <laughs> variety of how you can influence, uh, your body and your mind through everything from how you eat to, how you move, how you think, what your ancestors did. It's, it's, it, it gives us much more power over, you know, and control over our outcomes, but it also gives us a lot more responsibility. And uh, being in fitness, you know, uh, one of the most common uh, pitfalls I see people getting stuck in is the whole, well, I'm just, you know, it's my genes. I'm, I'm, I'm overweight because it's my genes or 
I can't do this because it's just it runs on my family. Um, and it, it's, it almost seems like oh, oh, we want to adopt it because it removes responsibility from ourselves and maybe even our parents. Nobody wants to think that what they're doing now is going to negatively affect their grandkid that they have yet to have, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> so it just uh, – what an uphill battle. Well, yes, and, and actually the, the selfish gene theory and neo-Darwinism and all of that is an extremely disempowering philosophy. Um, it, 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 it creates exactly the kind of victimization and lack of responsibility that you're talking about. So, um, you know, in fact, Dawkins describes as, as um, we are lumbering robots controlled by our genes and the genes are sealed off from everything else. And, you know, and, and it, 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 it also engenders this kind of narcissistic self-centered behavior um, you know, like, well, my genes are selfish, so I guess I should be selfish. Oh, well, oh, actually, everybody, you should be altruistic because we get to just, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really confused. And, and you're right, you know, like, well, you know, I'm overweight because I guess I just inherited these genes. So I guess I'm just destined to go to Quick Shop and get a Twinkie, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's absurd and it's, it's really hurting people. Um, it's, it's, not, it's a big deal. Yeah. And this, these, you know, it, in science, I think many times for myself, I, I, call, I consider myself a very logical individual and there are things that science really frustrate me with. And it's this whole concept of random, you know, oh, it's just, <laughs> it's just, yes. ra- it's just random. It's just the way things are, mm-hmm. you know, just randomly combined and, you know, oh, fine. If we accept that, let's look at the odds for a well, second. That sounds a lot like faith. It, it it does. It sounds like another form of a religion. If we if we really break it down and look at the odds, it's of, just that you can't explain it. If we look at the odds of random, um, gosh, it would be the equivalent of me buying a box of Legos, shaking the Legos, and at some point a dove comes it, out. I'll randomly <laughs> assemble a you know a starship or something like that. <laughs> yeah, just from sh- it, it actually has- it went way worse though. Way way worse odds than that. Well, it, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. In fact, this is a major major theme of my book, Evolution 2.0. And when I started researching evolution, I, I got thrown into this. I kind of got drug into it. I wasn't looking for it. It came looking for me. And um, and I and and you know, at the at the core, at the very root of of traditional Darwinism is this idea that you just have random changes in genes and random changes in DNA and copying errors and stuff. And then survival of the fittest weeds it all out. And what I, what I quickly figured out is I am, I am a communications engineer by education and I wrote an ethernet book in 2002 and I had this giant epiphany. It was like, it was like, you know, like the heavens open and the angels sang and I suddenly made this giant connection. Hey, wait a minute. Everything that I wrote in this Ethernet book is also true of DNA. DNA is a digital communication system. It's digital code. It, there's a format to the code. It has, it has start bits and stop bits and packets. And, and in fact, the, the parallels were absolutely scary. Now, in in ethernet in wi-fi in your skype you know we're, we're talking over skype right now randomness is noise and noise destroys always no exceptions ever if you run the statistics on this if you actually compute the probabilities that you could get a gene by a random process they are the most absurdly spectacularly huge numbers that you have ever seen ever in any math problem in your life, 10 to the power of 200, 10 to the power of 2000, 10 to the power of 200,000. Like you have to have such an extreme level of faith to believe that it's ridiculous. Well, the earth, okay? the so, earth isn't even old yeah. enough to, <laughs> to, uh, even make sense with those kinds of odds. I mean, uh, this is probably why now you're starting to see more, scientists, you know, come up with alternative theories like, you know, panspermia, you know, maybe right. DNA that existed, you know, for billions and billions of years before us came here and was seeded on earth from meteors and 
It's just uh, the odds are so astronomical. I actually heard a scientist talk about the origin of life on Earth, and he compared it to a tornado flying through a junkyard and assembling a fighter jet. He said it was just the odds were even worse than that. Just literally it's impossible. Um, and it, it kind of begs the, you know, some pretty interesting questions, doesn't mm. it? It, it sure it sure does and 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 what this led me to do was to create a technology prize um, for people to actually solve this and so so uh, I realized you know from from my Ethernet book and everything you know there's a million codes out there there's zip codes barcodes QR codes HTML Chinese English etc they're all codes. Out of a million codes, 999,999 are designed. And, and there's one code we don't know where it came from, and it's called DNA. Mm. And as a communications engineer, I can assure you it's more sophisticated than TCP, IP, or anything that's in your computer. And so it has every appearance of being designed. And and I, I got on the internet, this is around 2005, and I started advocating this argument and I started mixing it up with people and you know I got really good at like bonking atheists over the head and <laughs> and and a very sophist you know a very uh, very practiced uh, version of the of what you just said okay but what I realized over time I, I mean I really I talked to lots of people and lots of scientists and, and what I what I, I I started to come to a slightly different take on this which was well what if there is a natural process that creates codes? What if the universe itself is conscious? What if there are laws of physics that we don't know about? What if somebody can eventually figure this out? What if there's more and more and more and more and more and more layers of the onion? And plus, um, just practically speaking, if, if a scientist says, well... <clears throat> God created life, which I'm totally fine with. I mean, I'm a Christian, and I, I don't have any fundamental problem with that. I think that's fine. But but a scientist does not get to say, God did it. That settles it. Let's go out for three martini lunch. <laughs> a scientist doesn't get to do that. A, science can, a scientist can only get a paycheck by peeling the onion one more layer. But if you if you look at the history of science, there's always another layer and there's always another layer and there's always another layer. So so what I did was I put together a technology prize sort of like the X prize for space flight or some of these kinds of things and uh, right now it's a 3 million dollar prize and in fact I've 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 continued to get backers and we'll uh, won't be too long before we raise the amount and raise the publicity on it, but it's called the Evolution 2.0 Prize, and it is a search for a naturally occurring code. If you can get an actual code to self-organize uh, by some physical process without cheating, then in my opinion, you will have s solved one of the 10 biggest unanswered questions in all of science and your name will go down in history. And if what you discovered is patentable, I've got a group of private equity investors under the company Natural Code LLC, and we will buy the patent from you uh, because we think it would be extremely valuable. It, it would probably crack the code on strong artificial intelligence. And so I'm very interested in scientific answers to these questions. What I'm not interested in is these silly little just so stories that people make up and go, well, I've got a, I, uh, I'm a professor at Oxford, so you should believe me. I don't, I don't like that at all. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. you, you're pointing to uh, a conclusion that things were designed and not random, which sounds very much like religion would sound i'm sure you get a lot of pushback from some of your colleagues in science well so i think i think somewhere probably about 150 years ago the relationship between faith and science went off the rails now i'll give you i'll give you a couple examples of where this happened um have you ever heard the story that 
the queen of Spain told Christopher Columbus he shouldn't go to America because he would fall off the edge of the earth. Have you ever heard that story? Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a total urban legend. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Of course. It was made up by a guy named John Draper in the 1870s. And his, in, he did it in order to make Catholics look stupid. <laughs> um, the actual fact is no educated person in Christopher Columbus' time thought the earth was flat. In fact, no educated person in at least 2,000 years has thought the earth was flat. They just thought the earth was either bigger or, you know, they had all these arguments about how far away India is or whatever. But they didn't think it was flat. That is a total urban legend, okay? And 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 uh, in 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 history, they call this the conflict thesis, and it's the idea that science and religion are at war. Nobody thought science and religion were at war before about 1850, and and so what what you have in the in the last like in the last 50 years is you have the creationists battling it out with the atheists, and um. The, the creationists are, they're advocating God of the gaps where, well, you know, God beamed zebras uh, from heaven onto the savannah and it suddenly appeared there munching grass. And that's what Genesis says. And by the way, that is not what Genesis says. It says, let the ground produce living creatures. That is what it says. Mm-hmm. So like the Genesis story is not anti-evolution. Um, and then, and then you, you, you have very, and I know I'm friends with a lot of scientists and, and you, you have them being really legitimately concerned, um, that, um, that if, um, if, if we, uh, here, I'll, I'll read you something a scientist sent to me. Uh, this will, this will probably do. He says, We both see the fault in the current evolution paradigm. The art, in my opinion, is to convince the biomedical research community that there's a better way. I've been struggling with this issue for more than 15 years now, publishing and sharing meetings both in the U.S. and in Europe. And in my own sense is there's fear in the group that if they blink on the subject of Darwinian evolution, the intelligent design people will literally and figuratively eat their lunch. So the task is to switch to another paradigm while sustaining the existing one. A scientist sent me that in an email. And what he's saying is that, is that the religious people are just as guilty as the atheists in perpetuating a war between practicing scientists and religion, which doesn't actually exist. Um, my my view um, of religion and, and as a Christian is God is the ultimate rationale for believing that we live in a universe that runs on discoverable, intelligible laws that make sense and that can be reduced to equations. It's our reason for expecting the equations will be beautiful, not ugly, symmetrical, not asymmetrical, and that there's elegant forms and principles behind everything and the rest is all up for discovery and you do not know how deep the the rabbit hole goes and that is the view that isaac newton had that's the view that galileo had that's the view that maxwell and boyle and kepler and all these classical scientists had almost all of these guys were deeply religious and it did not in any way shape or form get in way of their science. In fact, they regarded the practice of science as an act of worship. You can regard the building of your body as an act of worship, of not yourself, of something greater than you. You The, the building of your mind, the building of a company, any of that can be regarded as an act of worship, as an act of gratitude, and it doesn't take anything away from what you actually do. It's, well it's you know, for me personally, when I hear someone who's an atheist, to me they sound uh, very similar to somebody who is very religious because in both cases, both people are saying, I know mm-hmm. what there is. I know what's going on. They've stopped right there. On one hand, you've got someone who says, there's nothing out there. 
I know this. On the other hand, people are, you know, you've got people saying, I know what's out there and this is what it is. And to me, you know, objectively speaking, I can say to both of them, nobody has any idea. We only know what we know, but we have no, we don't know what we don't know. And there's a lot. And if, and if science has told us anything, it's that the more we learn, the more we learn that we don't, we simply don't know. One of the, the, one of the theories that resonates with me uh, is how, uh, you know, everything is a program and we're in some sort of a cosmic simulation, which is interesting because it really, I mean, I don't know if that really matters uh, one way or the other. We wouldn't know the difference either way and it, what's real is real. Um, but when you start uh, looking for clues in some of the most advanced forms of science, um, they seem to back it up. You know, when you look at things like, you know, uh, how cosmic rays travel on a lattice that seems to, you know, on a lattice of equal, you know, parts or Planck length, which is the smallest unit of measurement. Everything's measured up into these these same units of measurement called Planck length um, or how, you know, you could get, um, you know, particles to become entangled to where they seem to be touching at all times, even if one's on one side of the universe and one the other one's on the other side of the universe. It all, to me, feels like almost like a video game. Like it follows the same laws of a video game. Um, so go ahead. I, I think all of us, um, we, we understand the universe in the model. We just in the language and the descriptions of whatever we understand. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we live in a video game age and, and a computer age. So all this stuff talk about codes and everything that we've been talking today, a lot of it has really been in computer terminology. And of course I told you about my epiphany from writing an ethernet book. And what I, what I would like, um, what I would like to point out, um, with your, your um, simulation hypothesis is I don't personally agree with the simulation hypothesis, but here's something that I think is really valuable about it. As an engineer, I believe that the standard for science is engineering. And what I mean by that is if you can't build it, you don't understand it. <laughs> okay. If you can't reproduce it, you don't understand it. That's the engineer's standard. Okay. Okay. And so let's say that we were going to build a complete and a completely accurate model of the universe or even just part of it. And we're going to do it on a computer and it was going to be like a computer game. Right. Now that's a totally legitimate question. Right. Because that's really what we want to do. Well, I would just admit to you that no matter what you do and how you do it, your simulation ha would have to be exquisitely precise or it would not work. Mm -hmm. And if the simulation has to be exquisitely precise or it will not work, then that means the real thing you're trying to model is also exquisitely precise. And it is not an illusion. You actually know that from trying to simulate it. You know, any astronomer that builds a model of the Big Bang or, you know, all this kind of stuff, I mean – the numbers have to be tweaked to an un incredible number of decimal places just to work. Um, hopefully, most people have heard about the fine-tuning of, of the universe where, like, if the Big Bang was off by, like, one decimal place in 120, that we wouldn't even have a universe because stars wouldn't form or it would just collapse in on itself. People do not know how exquisitely precise this universe that we have is. And then circling back to, you know, the human genome and all that people don't know how exquisitely precise it is. And it's not an accumulation of random accidents because that whole story I told you about what the grandmother's body is doing, what that's telling you is evolution isn't random. It's in response to the environment all the time. It's going on 24, seven, 365 feedback loops and feedback loops and feedback loops going on constantly. Now, knowing that, um, and I agree with you, um, the science is pointing very strongly to what you're saying. Knowing all that, obviously, we're in the fitness and nutrition industry, and we're constantly battling people who are saying things like, this engineered food or this processed meal uh, is equivalent to 
this other, you know, natural food that may have grown. And because we, their oh, calories equal yeah, or their macronutrients yeah, equal. Yeah, calories and yes. macronutrients and nutrients are in there. Or, hey, this artificial sweetener or color, you know, yes. it, it doesn't interact with any of these known actions within the body. Therefore, have as much as you want of it and it's not going to change <laughs> As anything. long as it fits in your calorie yeah. marker. Right? Now, knowing what you know about epigenetics and how complex it is, how ridiculous does that sound to you? Well, you only need to go further. So I, I'm reminded, I, I went I th- went through the, in Dublin, Ireland, I went through the Guinness Museum and they had the advertisements for how, you know, Guinness is really good for you and keeps you from being sick back in like 1910, right? It's got iron and then in you it. go to the 1960s when baby formula was better than breast milk and like that's a load of BS. Like this is just another version of that. And, and like, like I totally don't buy it. In fact, you know, there's a great chapter in Nassim Nicholas Taleb book, Anti-Fragile. There's a whole chapter about what's called iatrogenics, which is just a big fancy word for harming when you intended to heal, right? It's like medicine gone awry. And, and he, he gives all these examples where, you know, they're selling medications and foods and all this different kind of stuff um, that, you know, allegedly, you know, is going to help you in this way or that way. And then, oh, guess what? 25 years later, you find out it causes prostate cancer. 25 years later, you find out it causes heart attacks. It, it causes hardening of the arteries or anything. He has a rule. He won't drink any beverage that's less than 1,000 years old. Beer, good. Tea, good. You know, milk, good. Um, you know, energy drinks, probably not so good, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the older it is, the better it is. And and that that's anti-fragile, right? That That is, you know, get stronger when threatened instead of weakening and crumbling. That's the whole idea of anti-fragile. And so I'm totally with you. Like, w- again, we're you know, worse than 12 year olds tinkering with Ferraris. We don't know, you know, and, and look, I'm a marketing guy. Okay. I'm a, I told like, I marketers are justifiably cynical people. You ever, you ever sat in a room full of marketers? <laughs> now, now here's the thing about marketers. I got, got to say this, and this is going to offend some people. So I know a lot of marketers and I know a lot of scientists and you know what? marketers are better at recognizing their own self-deception than scientists. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> when, That's spicy. <laughs> when, when, look, when, I mean, I know guys, they, they, they shoot infomercials and sell exercise machines and they know 97% of those exercise machines are going to, they're going to get shipped to the customer. They're going to get billed. The thing's going to end up on under somebody's bed in three days and never come out. And they know it. Okay. And they don't have any delusions about it. They just got a job to do. Everybody's got to eat. So they're going to sell the exercise machines. Okay. I think, and so mar- marketers are actually pretty good at not believing their own PR. <laughs> <laughs> But but scientists don't realize how much of what they do is assumptions piled on assumptions piled on assumptions. In fact, if if you want a really interesting book that just came out last year, that's one of the best books. It's one of the best science books of of the decade. It's called Cosmo Sapiens by John Hans, and it's a big giant book. And you don't have to read all of it; you could just pick chapters. But it's basically a grand tour of all of the big question stuff in science: the Big Bang, the origin of life, the origin of consciousness, all evolution, all this kind of stuff. Well, a couple of interesting things about this book. First of all, he completely into. I did not know. I know John now. I did not know him at all when he was writing the book. We didn't have any contact of any form. He came to almost identical conclusions about evolution as me. It was really spooky, okay? And the, and the second thing is, like, you go from one subject to the next, to the next, to the next, and he shows you that you have entire schools of thought built on assumptions that are shaky at best. And, and based on reading this book, I would predict that by the year 2100, 
60 to 80 percent of what we think we're absolutely sure that we know in science will have proven to be wrong. Well, we're, we see we see it. We're seeing it right now in some in some cases. I mean, probably one of the biggest uh, new breakthrough fields. Oh God, we were just demonizing fat a couple years ago. We, I mean, one <laughs> of the, one of the one of the breakthrough fields uh, of research when it comes to the human body right now is the discovery uh, of the microbiome um, of and how important that is in everything from your physical health to how you think. And I can't help but think of your example of all of the random, you know, how, how they think everything's so random and how the odds are so impossible for something like that to happen. Well, holy cow, if you now add in the genes and the potential, you know, filters and screens that your that the bacteria that's in and on your body and how those interact with all of your genes and those, you know, filters. Wow, that's got to be. I, I I can't even imagine what that number is going to look like. What that number looks like. Um, and do it, your do your listeners all know what the microbiome is, or do we? Yeah, we we've do, done we episodes. Do, yeah, on we that. discuss this. Mm-hmm. Well, do, have you guys ever talked about Lynn Margulis and symbiogenesis theory and how that was ferociously opposed? No, do you guys know that story. No, no. no. Yeah. sure. No. Okay, so this, 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 hand in glove with with the macrobiome. Okay, so, um, this, so, every look out the window and you see a, a tree or or grass or or whatever or or a bush. Every green thing that you see looking out the window is green because of chloroplast. Now every like probably everybody knows that the chloroplast is the thing that turns light into energy mm-hmm. and, and, and stuff. Well, what p- most people don't know, you know what a chloroplast actually is? It's a blue green algae mm. that lives inside the grass, the leaves. It lives inside a eukaryotic plant cell and it has its own DNA it reproduces independently. It is um, effectively an independent life form, but it's entered into symbiosis with the plant in a partnership. It's like a Starbucks inside a Marriott hotel. <laughs> Great analogy. <laughs> okay. Now I see it. Uh, it's like, sure, hey, everywhere. man, we're just yeah. getting more people, you know, coming in this lobby if we have a Starbucks in here, right? So <laughs> I'd like a frappuccino. It's symbiotic, right? Yeah. Well, uh, the mitochondria in your the mitochondria are the parts of your cells that turn oxygen into energy. Mitochondria are free living bacteria that were captured by cells and entered into symbiotic relationship. Well, symbiosis is a major, 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 major component of evolution. In fact, most of the big evolutionary jumps in history, were symbiotic mergers. In fact, the way evolution works is constant, 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 sudden change, constant, 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 sudden change. This is one of the things Darwin was wrong about. He thought it was gradual, gradual, gradual. It's not. It's slight improvement, slight improvement, slight improvement, major quantum leap. It's like, it's just like human technologies where you only had records and then all of a sudden you had cassettes and then you only had cassettes and then you had CDs and, and, and so forth. Okay. It's, it's, it's the same Hmm. thing. Well, Lynn Margulis figured out that these symbiotic events were major events in evolutionary history at about, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, she wrote this seminal paper and it got rejected by 15 science journals um, and, 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 and she, she fought these guys tooth and nail. Well, not only that, now this is in the sixties. Okay. Now her entire theory is, 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 is accepted today. And in fact, there's even more interesting things that we might be able to get to about that. But, but you know, what's even more ironic is the Russians had figured all of this out by the 1920s. So, so American evolutionary biology has consistently been 50 years behind the latest science 
and for the most part, still is. So knowing this information, uh, what, how does this influence your day-to-day for you? Um, you know. Well, so, so, so let, let me give you a little, like a little cherry on top with symbiogenesis theory. So there was a guy named James Lovelock in the 1970s, and he was involved in looking for life on other planets. And what he came to realize is that the earth for all practical purposes is also an organism. The earth holds itself far from equilibrium to the temperature and the pressure that it wants. Okay, so like, for example, all, all of our neighboring planets have a whole bunch of carbon dioxide and very little oxygen. Our planet has very little carbon dioxide and a whole bunch of oxygen. Why? Because the, the living things on Earth want it that way. Okay, so what's going on is that there's cells inside of cells inside of cells um, and, and that most of evolution is cooperation, not competition. Mm, that's most of evolution is cooperation, mm. not competition. So this changes everything. And in fact, the whole entire earth is a single cooperative organism for all practical purposes. And so this totally like this, this is a fundamental shift in the outlook of your entire world view. It's not selfish gene that makes things happen in the world. It's cooperation. It's mergers. It's interesting serendipities. It's putting the Starbucks inside the Marriott. Mm-hmm. It's harnessing the existing thing. It's transforming the existing thing by putting two things together that were never put together before. You don't need a new idea. You only need two old ideas having a new relationship to each other. Very, very interesting. Yeah. I, I can't – at this – now I'm directed to think about uh, our own technological advancements and how that mimics, uh, you know, evolution in nature. And, uh, you know, where is our evolution in technology taking us? It looks like artificial intelligence. It looks like you we're – You see us all already getting super connected, you know, just from the internet. And I just keep thinking about the hive mind theory and, and how, you know, as we, we – progress with technology how that brings us even closer together and like reading each other's thoughts and like kind of getting down that direction well all evolution um follows a similar set of principles whether it's technological evolution or um jazz or fitness or or politics, or biology. There's a common set of principles that is seen in all of these things. And in fact, you know, it's kind of weird for a marketing business guy, engineer like me to go write an evolution book, obviously. I mean, we talked about this, you know, when when, when uh, I first came on. But what I find is my customers really get this book, Evolution 2.0. And the reason, here's why. All of my customers, their marketers, their entrepreneurs, their business owners, all of them and you guys, we all have a gun to our head every single day of our life going evolve or go extinct. Like, you know, the website has to load faster. The software has to get better. Um, you know, the, 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 the interface has to be simpler. The, the feature set has to go up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't, it's like, we have to do this all the time. And, and so it's like people instinctively at a gut level, get this, you know, who doesn't get it? Bureaucrats. Of course not. (laughs) Well, I think, I think they're involved in their own, uh, self-survival Mm. Are they not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let, let me, let's just. Let's, uh, Perry, I want to. I want to talk about the, what's the scary side to this. Then, you know, what do you? What do you? What what scares you about where we're going and mm-hmm. where where the hum, where human technology is taking us? What what are the fears that you personally have? Well, so so I I, I do think that making artificial organisms and selling them um, in little petri dishes and shipping them by UPS is pretty scary. 
<laughs> um, it sounds like the beginning like, of a really good sci-fi movie. Yeah, to be honest, <laughs> I know. And, and, and look, I gotta say, like, just watch a sci-fi movie. That's all you need to do because it's those guys' job to think through all this stuff, and they do a much better job of thinking through it than guys that that wear white coats and work in, in labs. And isn't that funny? How and that often works? have poor mm-hmm. communication skills, right? <laughs> um, and, and and so so really, like like okay, just watch Ex Machina or just watch. Great Terminator or mm-hmm. just watch, you know, uh, the matrix or whatever. Uh, I, I really do have concerns about this stuff. Now you talked about artificial intelligence and, and now we don't right now, true artificial intelligence doesn't exist. Like we call it AI, but like, you know, you talk to Siri, Siri is, is as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> you talk to Alexa, they're just algorithms and everybody knows it. Mm-hmm. And everybody, there's nobody in there. Now, I think in order to solve chemicals to code and win my prize, I think somebody's going to have to figure out consciousness. Good luck. I think I think I think the universe is consciousness first, chemical second. Who I think life is co- consciousness first, chemical second. There's a great book by hmm, Robert Lanza call, called Biocentrism, which makes a beautiful, very rigorous case for this. It's it's a beautiful book, and now I, I think you're going to have to solve this. Now the scary part is is what if we do, and and. And as um, so, so here's the irony. This stuff scares me, um, but I have a prize for it because I believe that. See, I believe humanity is going to figure this out one way or another. Human beings are always opening Pandora's box. I just think it's a question of who opens it and under what pretenses and what kind of conversations and consciousness have preceded that to where people either can handle it responsibly or do not handle it responsibly. Okay, so on that so, note, what is your what is your thoughts then on 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 stuff like LSD that alters consciousness or that people feel like they are in another state of consciousness when they take it? What's your thought on that? Oh boy, um, that that's really like way outside of my expertise. Uh, I can tell you, I don't want my kids taking LSD. <laughs> now, funny thing, if, if funny, funny you bring this up. Last night, I was sitting on the couch with my twelve-year-old in front of the stereo, and I'm playing a song by Porcupine Tree called Voyage Thirty Four. And what Voyage Thirty Four? It's a song about the thirty-fourth LSD trip that went bad. Oh shit. <laughs> so like literally 12 hours ago that's what i was doing um <laughs> Ser- so, serendipitous I, I, feel, I feel like the, listen to you, listen to voyage 34 by porcupine tree and make up your own mind that's, that's my <laughs> well you know i like to think of the you know i've heard people refer to it as the technological singularity where artificial intelligence um then is able to invent technology smarter and more advanced than itself and how it's this huge danger you've got some of the greatest minds of the world warning us on artificial (laughs) intelligence and my personal view is a little bit different you know if something does become self-aware and that smart i i don't think they'll view us as competition Mm. i think that they could Mm. just develop their own reality and just disappear into it like why would they want to be in this world when they can go into their own world and disappear there was actually a movie uh, called her with uh, I can't remember who the who starred in that Walking mm. Phoenix, Walking Phoenix. Yeah. and in that movie the AI just disappeared into the internet it wasn't a threat and I, mm. I that's kind of my mentality like why would why would these machines or whatever want to kill us why wouldn't they just create their own world and hmm. go into it and leave us that that's that's a that's a very interesting perspective I I hadn't really thought of that I my my own perspective is is that um, the the problem with technology is more that people use it as a drug. Um, I think that's the real danger. In in fact, in in my, you know, my entrepreneurial tribe, um, I've been encouraging people to get off social media. Um, I uh, like like if if you're part of Perry's thirty day reboot. Um, 
no social media until after 5 p.m. and then only 30 minutes a day. Like that's plenty. Um, and, and I got all these people saying, oh my word, I had no idea how much time I was burning up like on this mindless activity and fighting with people about Trump and Hillary on Facebook and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And like, I've barely been on Facebook in six months and I feel great. Like, you know, uh, I spend about 15 minutes a week and like, okay, that's enough. Hmm. Um, and I think that's the real danger. I think people like people sleepwalking through life because of technology, like, hello, we live in the most amazing period of time ever, more information, everything. And most people are playing candy crush. Oh no. Have you seen, have you, have you, are you familiar with Steven Kotler? No. He did the rise of super. You would enjoy his rise of Superman. It's all about being present. You know, we talked, we, we had him on the show recently and he talks about Mm -hmm. macro and micro states of flow and that we get into this and talking about the brain and, and learning to be, as present and technology is taking us further and further away from that. And that's the scary thought to me is well, for, I just like feel, what you're saying right I, now, becoming, I, I just feel like, you know, we humans do a really good job of asking ourselves if we could, uh, and not enough, uh, of asking ourselves if we should. Mm-hmm. Right. The, like the Jurassic park movie. Nobody really thought about whether we should do this. <laughs> exactly. It just sounded so cool. Exactly. So, and when it comes to technology, I mean, it really highlights that I think for all human, always has been for humans, our greatest, uh, you know, strengths tend to be our greatest weaknesses. And we've got this incredible technology and this amazing ability to connect. And unfortunately, a lot of us use it to disconnect um, uh, rather That's than right. connect. So, um, That's right. It's been fantastic talking to you, Perry. I've had a great, just great conversation. Is there anything you'd like to leave uh, our audience with? Any thoughts or statements? Um, yeah, ignore no verifiable fact. <laughs> um, when 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 I went down the evolution rabbit hole, um, and, and you, you can you can get my evolution book on Audible and on Amazon and Kindle and hardcover. Um, when I went down the evolution rabbit hole, I was what you would classify as a old earth creationist and you know god made the world and you know humans are pretty nice piece of engineering um and like i didn't really want to shake up that belief but i i said you know what i'm going to follow the evidence wherever it leads and what it led me to was something so much greater than what i had previously imagined and you know if i was going to summarize my book in two sentences it would be darwinists underestimate nature and creationists (laughs) underestimate God. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump.